Grober's algorithm solves the problem of finding a special input to a function. Specifically, suppose we have a function f whose value is 0 for all inputs, except for some special input x star for which its value is 1. Grober's algorithm finds x star. Given no additional information about f, that is, all we can do is evaluate it, the most efficient way to find x star is to sequentially test all inputs until 1 returns 1. Here's an implementation in Python. Now you may be thinking this seems very silly. We can see what x star is. It's 8. We don't need an algorithm to tell us that. It's right there. There are two ways to address this. One, this is just a toy example. In reality, Grover's algorithm assumes f is a black box. We can't look inside to see its internals. We just give it an input and get an output. This explanation isn't very compelling to me. It makes Grover's algorithm seem impractical. The explanation I like better is that this problem is equivalent to function inversion, which is very practical. For many functions, we know how to compute, but don't know how to invert. The security of password storage relies on this. In this context, these difficult to invert functions are called hash functions. Password cracking is inverting a hash function. It's straightforward to modify the initial implementation of Grover's algorithm I gave to invert functions and specifically invert a hash function and crack my password. The quantum version of this problem deals with vectors instead of numbers and linear transformations instead of functions. The function f becomes the linear transformation O for Oracle. O acting on any basis vector x aside from x star produces x and O acting on x star gives negative x star. O can be concisely expressed in terms of the function f from the classical problem. The problem that Grover's algorithm solves is given the oracle O, find the vector x star such that O acting on x star equals negative x star. Grover's algorithm outperforms the classical algorithm by making use of the fact that a quantum system can be in a superposition of classical states. Passing a superposition through the oracle essentially allows us to check multiple classical states simultaneously. So to check all of the classical states at once, we pass the uniform superposition through the oracle. However, though x star has been marked at this point, we aren't done. We don't ever get to observe a quantum system in superposition. It collapse to one of the basis states upon measurement. If we were to measure the system at this point, it would have an equal probability of collapsing to any given basis state. So we'd be just as well off guessing at x star. The problem is figuring out how to make the fact that x star is special measurable. It's helpful to look at the case of a single qubit system where x star equals 1. If we follow the application of the oracle with the application of a Hadamard gate, we can easily discover x star with the measurement. Let's implement this. The oracle in this case is simply the poly z gate, and we're already familiar with creating the uniform superposition and Hadamard gates. Making a measurement after creating the uniform superposition tells us nothing. Making a measurement immediately following the application of the oracle also tells us nothing, which illustrates the initial problem. The fact that the special state has been marked doesn't make it measurable. The solution in this case is to apply another Hadamard gate. This isn't exactly what Grover's algorithm does, but it's an easily understood mimicry, and if we look closer, it contains the germ of the idea. We start with the uniform superposition, mark the special state, then increase the amplitude of the special state at the expense of the amplitudes of all other basis states. If we continue to repeat this procedure, at some point the amplitude of x star will be sufficiently large that we'll have a good chance of collapsing the system to x star upon measurement. Grover's algorithm can also be understood geometrically. The state of the system lives in the plane spanned by the uniform superposition and x star. The oracle reflects the state about the horizontal axis, and a reflection about the uniform superposition will bring the state closer to x star than it initially was. Repeating this procedure gets us closer and closer to x star. To recap, Grover's algorithm starts with the system in the state 0, transforms it to the uniform superposition, and then repeatedly applies the subroutine, which consists of applying the oracle followed by a reflection about the uniform superposition. The operator that represents this reflection is called the Grover diffusion operator, by the way. After doing this enough times, the state of the system will be approximately x star, so making a measurement will result and collapse the state x star with a reasonably high probability. One property of the subroutine is that if it's applied to a vector that can be expressed as a linear combination of s and x star, the resulting vector can also be expressed as a linear combination of s and x star. This is because the oracle and the Grover diffusion operator both have this property. Because s and x star are not orthogonal, I'm going to introduce another vector, s prime. s prime and x star span the same space that s and x star do, but are orthonormal. It's easy to show that an arbitrary vector in the s prime x star subspace stays in the s prime x star subspace after being acted on by the oracle and the Grover diffusion operator. Because the uniform superposition is in the s prime x star subspace, the state vector of the system stays in the subspace throughout the algorithm. Further, not only does the state vector stay in this two-dimensional subspace, but it also stays in the further restricted space where the coefficients in front of s prime and x star are real numbers. And a two-dimensional vector space over the real numbers is isomorphic to the plane. So it's perfectly rigorous to visualize the state vector of the system throughout Grover's algorithm as an arrow on a piece of paper.
Note the massive simplification here. The state vector lives in a two to the n dimensional vector space over the complex numbers, but Grover's algorithm keeps it in a two dimensional vector space over the real numbers. Understanding Grover's algorithm is tantamount to understanding O and D. And thanks to the previous argument, we can think about these geometrically. O is a reflection about S prime. In general, the linear transformation that represents a reflection about a normalized vector W is two times the projection onto W minus the identity transformation. This is precisely the form of the Grover diffusion operator, which turns out to be nothing more than a reflection about the uniform superposition. So the subroutine performs a reflection about S prime followed by a reflection about S. If the angle between our state vector and S prime prior to applying the subroutine is phi, then the angle between our state vector and S prime after applying the subroutine will be phi plus two theta, where theta is the angle between S prime and S. So the subroutine rotates to the state vector two theta closer to X star with each application. Since the initial angle between the state vector and S prime is theta, after applying the subroutine R times, the angle will be two R plus one times theta. Because psi of R lives in the S prime X star plane, we can write it as a linear combination of S prime and X star. The coefficient in front of s prime is cosine 5r, and the coefficient in front of x star is sine 5r. So the probability of finding the system to be in the state x star upon measurement is sine squared 5r. The goal is to maximize this probability. Sine squared achieves its maximum of 1 when its argument is pi over 2. This is just another way of saying that when phi is equal to pi over 2, psi of r is equal to x star. So the probability of collapsing to the state x star upon measurement is 1. Theta is equal to the inverse sine of root 1 over 2 to the n, so 5r is equal to 2r plus 1 times the inverse sine of root 1 over 2 to the n. For moderate n, we can use the small angle approximation and replace the inverse sine of root 1 over 2 to the n with root 1 over 2 to the n. So phi of r is roughly equal to 2r plus 1 times root 1 over 2 to the n. Setting this equal to pi over 2, we find that we only need to apply the subroutine around root 2 to the n times to maximize the probability of collapsing the system to the state x star upon measurement. So Grover's algorithm only requires root 2 to the n queries to the oracle, whereas the best we can do classically is 2 to the n queries. To get an appreciation for the difference between the two, consider the case where n equals 30, and each query to the oracle takes one second. The classical algorithm would take around 30 years, whereas Grover's algorithm would be done in less than 10 hours. It's the difference between working one day and working every day of your life. Grover's algorithm can also be understood algebraically. The algebraic equivalent of the state vector lying in the S prime X star plane is that all basis states in the expansion of the state vector have the same amplitude, alpha r, except for X star, which has amplitude alpha r star. O affects the amplitude in a straightforward way. D is trickier. The inner product between S and the state vector after it's been acted on by O is equal to root 2 to the n times the average amplitude of the basis states in the expansion of the state vector after it's been acted on by O, mu sub r, O. So the result of applying O followed by D is to reflect the amplitudes of all basis states across mu sub r O. The result is that the amplitude of X star gets larger and the amplitudes of all other basis states get smaller. That's why this is called the amplitude amplification trick. So long as mu O is positive, alpha star increases with each application of the subroutine. This is the case when alpha star is less than 2 to the n minus 1 times alpha. How many times do we have to apply the subroutine to have at least a 50% chance of collapsing to the state x star upon measurement? That is, to have alpha star at least 1 over root 2. When alpha star is 1 over root 2, alpha is 1 over root 2 times 2 to the n minus 1. So mu o is at least 1 half times 1 over root 2 to the n, provided n is at least 4. And Grover's algorithm would be unnecessary if it weren't. This is the smallest mu o ever gets during the algorithm. It's a lower bound. This also gives a lower bound on how much alpha star increases with an application of the subroutine. It increases by at least 1 over root 2 to the n. Since the initial value of alpha star is 1 over root 2 to the n, then it increases by at least the same amount with each application of the subroutine. After our application of the subroutine, alpha star will be at least 1 over root 2 to the n times r plus 1. This means that to get alpha star greater than or equal to 1 over root 2 requires at most root 2 to the n minus 1 minus 1 applications of the subroutine. This is the same conclusion we reached through the geometric analysis. We only have to query the oracle a number of times proportional to root 2 to the n as compared to 2 to the n times in the classical case. Grover's algorithm is a quadratic speed up. The first step in implementing Grover's algorithm is to transform the state 0 into the uniform superposition, which we can do by applying a Hadamard gate to each of the qubits. The oracle changes depending on the application, so it has no general implementation. So next and finally, we have to implement D. 
Figuring out how to implement D is simpler if we think about it as a reflection about zero preceded and followed by applying a Hadamard gate to each qubit rather than as a reflection about S. It's equivalent to a reflection about S because applying H to an arbitrary vector followed by taking the inner product with zero is equivalent to taking the inner product with S. This is true because H, like all other transformations implemented by quantum gates, is a unitary transformation. And unitary transformations have the property that their Hermitian adjoint is equal to their inverse, and H is its own inverse. This is a useful reinterpretation of D because we know how to implement H, and implementing the reflection about zero is simple as well. When acting on the basis states, a reflection about zero negates the coefficient in front of all basis states other than zero and leaves zero unchanged. So to implement the reflection about zero, we or together all n of our qubits, which produces a one if any of them are in the state one and a zero otherwise. That is, if the n qubits were in the state zero. We then use the result of the or as the control bit on a controlled knot acting on the state one over root two times zero minus one. In the case that the result of the or was a zero, we don't do anything because the control bit is off. And in the case that the first n qubits were in a state other than zero, the control bit is on, so we get a negative sign in front of our state. Implementing the n bit or gate for more fundamental quantum gates can be done efficiently, but the general implementation is beyond the scope of this video. We've shown that 5r, the angle between our state vector, psi of r, and s prime after r iterations of the subroutine, is equal to 2r plus 1 times the inverse sine of 1 over root 2 to the n. When 5r is equal to pi over 2, psi of r is equal to x star, the state we're trying to find. If n equals 2, a single application of the subroutine will transform s into x star. So if we make a measurement, we're guaranteed to find the system to be in the state x star. This is a simple illustration of the power of Grover's algorithm. n equals 2 means there are four possible values of x star. So in the classical case, we may have to check up to three values of x before finding x star. In the quantum case, a single query of the oracle is always sufficient to find x star. Before we go and implement Grover's algorithm, I want to review how to get a negative sign in front of a basis state. If we apply a not gate to the state 1 over root 2 times 0 minus 1, we swap the 0 and the 1, which is equivalent to adding a negative sign in front of the original state. We can create the state 1 over root 2 times 0 minus 1 by applying a Hadamard gate to the state 1. And then if we apply a second Hadamard gate after nodding 1 over root 2 times 0 minus 1, we end up with the state 1 again, but with a coefficient of negative 1. To get a negative sign in front of the state 0, we can do the same thing. You can get a negative sign in front of the basis states of a two qubit system with the same procedure by making the knot a control knot with the second qubit as the control bit. We're now in a position to implement Grover's algorithm for a two qubit system. First, we create the uniform superposition by applying a Hadamard gate to each qubit. Then we apply the subroutine, which consists of applying the oracle followed by the Grover diffusion operator. Here, we'll implement an oracle that selects the state 1, 1. We just saw how to implement this. Apply a Hadamard gate followed by a control knot followed by another Hadamard gate. The easiest way to implement the Grover diffusion operator is to apply Hadamard gate to each qubit, then perform a reflection about zero, and finally apply a Hadamard gate to each qubit again. A reflection about zero is the same thing as adding a negative sign in front of all basis states aside from zero, which we leave unchanged. We just saw how to get a negative sign in front of one one. For one zero, it looks like this, and zero one is symmetric. So these three sets of gates implement a reflection about zero. To complete the implementation of the Grover diffusion operator, we apply Hadamard gate to each of the qubits. Now, if we make a measurement, we should find the system to be in the state x star, in this case, 1, 1. And we do. So we found x star after a single query to the oracle. Now, I want to prove that this is actually working. This is the oracle here, and it's currently selecting the state 1, 1. Let's change it to select the state 1, 0, and 0, 0, and 0, 1. One note on this implementation is that the reflection about zero is not efficient. You can perform this reflection by oring all the qubits together and using the result as the control bit on a controlled knot. This is an efficient implementation because the number of gates required to implement the or scales as the number of qubits. That is, if you have twice as many qubits, you can perform the reflection with only twice as many gates. In the implementation here, since we're explicitly adding a negative sign in front of each basis state, and the number of basis state scales exponentially with the number of qubits, the number of gates required to implement the Grover diffusion operator also scales exponentially with the number of qubits, which defeats the purpose of Grover's algorithm. I still think this implementation is useful for pedagogical purposes since it's clear what's going on in the case of two qubits. Rather than throwing a negative sign in front of the basis states 1, 1, 1, 0, and 0, 1, and leaving 0, 0 unchanged, we can do the opposite. 
Adding a negative sign in front of 0, 0 and leaving all other basis states unchanged has the same effect, except for a negative sign. Of course, that negative sign just goes along for the ride through any other transformations and makes no difference when we make a measurement. So we can replace these three sets of gates with a single set of gates that negates the coefficient in front of 0. With this modification, we should still find the system to be in the state x star upon measurement, in this case, 1, 1. This is a more efficient implementation of the Grover diffusion operator.